Hey, good morning. It's time for another daily devotional. Today is episode number 39 of our study of the book of Acts. Today we're going to be in Acts chapter 21 verses 1 through 25. Now just to give you a little bit of a reminder of where we are at in this study, Paul is on his third missionary journey. He has been traveling through Asia and the Europe area to see the churches that he has already planted to encourage them, to strengthen them in the doctrines, to help correct them in any way that they can. And just to show out, to show love to them, because Paul loves these churches. He's giving his life for these churches. That's his calling in life, to minister and lead these churches. And so just to give you a picture on the map of where we are at in this study, Paul is right now in the area of Ephesus. <clears throat> he is not in Ephesus itself. He is in uh, this little community called um, Miletus. This is where it's along the coast. He had called for the elders from Ephesus. He gave them a final warning of things to be aware of, to things to watch out for, to thing, for things to do in order to shepherd the church. He told them to beware because after Paul departed from them, that there would be wolves that would come in, savage wolves from within who, was, who were looking to devour. It was very much the same words of Jesus when Jesus said, beware of those who come to you in sheep's clothing. They are wolves coming in sheep's clothing. They are there to deceive and destroy you and to eat you up from within, to destroy the church from the inside out. Well, that is the warning that Paul is going to give them. And then Paul is really going to declare to them the fact that he is never going to see them again, that this is probably the last time that they will ever see him in the, on this side of eternity. They will see him in heaven, but they would not see him any longer upon the earth. And that is the last warning that he is going to give. It's the last set of instruction that he's going to give. It's really the last pouring out love that he's going to give. From that point, they are going to set sail. And they're going to sail to a little place called Kos. Then they're going to sail to this island called Rhodes. Then to Petra, uh, uh, Petara. Then they're going to sail into the Phoenicia area, into Tyre, into Ptolemas, into Caesarea. And then he is going to go down into Jerusalem. So that's where we are at. He is finishing up the third missionary journey. And uh, that would have happened somewhere in the timeline of, of from 53 to 58 AD. So this condensed version we have in the book of Acts really is over a five-year time span. Well, let's look at the story and understand what God has for us today. Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them, who's the them? That was the Ephesian elders. We were meeting with them in Meletus and we departed from them and we went and set sail. And we ran a straight course and we came to Kos. The following day, we went to Rhodes. That's that little island. And then from there, we went to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. So this is, and I just want you to notice that little word. It says when we departed from them. This was, the, the word really indicates it was more literally we tore ourselves away from them. That, this was not an easy parting. This was a very difficult parting. But when we did, when we got away from them, tore ourselves away, when we, when we grieved with them, when we were sad, we finally said goodbye, we left them, and that's where we began to, sell, to sail forth. So just notice those little nuances in the story. And it says, when we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left and we sailed to Syria. And then we landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. So just stop right there for a second. I find it interesting that it says that they went to Tyre and they found disciples there. It does not say how they found disciples. It doesn't say how disciples ended up being there. It doesn't ever say and talk about a church being planted there. But I just want you to remember that the book of Acts is only a partial picture of the early church's activity. This spans years. There are years that are taking place in the book of Acts. We don't get the entire story. We only get a partial picture of the early church's activity, some of the highlights of the early church's activity. Now, when they were in Tyre, though, these disciples, through the Spirit, the Spirit of God will talk to us, 
Our job is to bring our requests to him. Our job is to pray to God. It's to connect with God. And God in turn talks to us through his word and through the spirit. Well, apparently God talked to these disciples through the spirit and said to Paul, there is going to be danger for you there in Jerusalem. Now, they were saying, so, so please don't go. They were prophesying of the danger that awaited him. But Paul felt the urge and felt the need to go. Now, we don't know if Paul was going against the Holy Spirit's direction. That would be called direct rebellion. Or if he was just implored to go by the Spirit, and the Spirit was just using these people to warn him and say, look, be on the guard, be aware, it's going to get tough. It's going to be tough when you get to Jerusalem. So just be aware of all of this. The key point in all of that is just being in tune with the Holy Spirit. Our job as Christians is to be in tune with God's Spirit, to understand God's Spirit. And the way that you understand it and know it is you train yourself to listen to the Spirit of God. You train it through prayer. You train yourself through being in the Word of God. You train yourself to hear the Spirit of God by being in tune with God. Those are all parts of how how we are in tune and how we listen to the Spirit of God in our lives. So let's keep going. When we had come to the end of those days, the days that they spent in Tyre, we departed and we went on our way. And all of these disciples that were there in Tyre accompanied us, along with their wives and their children. So they went along with us till we were out of the city. They walked with us, they prayed with us, they visited with us until we were out of the city. And we dealt down on the shore, and we prayed together. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. I, I love that picture, too, of they just kneeling down and praying together, praying for God's blessing to be upon Paul, and for Paul praying for those early disciples and their wives and their children there in Tyre. Uh, there was a, it's just part of the connection. That's part of the fellowship of believers, um, that we can pray together. I don't know. How often you do that? Do you do that often where you just have fellow believers and you just say, let's pray together. Let's kneel down. Let's pray together. Let's seek the Lord together. Let's connect in our fellowship through through the, the practice of prayer, the spiritual discipline of prayer. Well, they did, and we took leave of one another. We boarded the ship. They returned to their home. And when we have finished our voyage from Tyre, uh, we came to Ptolemas. And uh, we greeted the brethren when we got there. Again, there were disciples there. There were disciples everywhere they went. We greeted the brethren there, and we stayed with them one day. So there was there was familiarity everywhere they went. And, and I've noticed this. Everywhere you travel in the world, everywhere you travel in the country, you are always at home with other believers that there is a connection with other fellow Christians no matter where in the world you go. You can cross the globe and find a Christian who maybe even speaks a different language, but you feel at home. You feel connected to them because of our, our combined love of God and because the Holy Spirit is in us. He is in us. He is with us. And there is that connection. There's that closeness where we pray together. We greet each other. We stay with them. They will open up their hearts and their homes. They're hospitable. And that's the characteristic of following Christ. There is a love. There is a joy. There's a peace. There's a patience. There's a hospitality. There's a connection that's made with fellow believers, no matter where they are, in the world. So they came there, they greeted the brethren, they stayed with him a day, uh, a, a day, everywhere they went, in virtually every city they stopped, they felt home, they felt companions. And there is a deepening of the Christian movement everywhere across the Roman Empire. Christians were everywhere, it seemed, as Paul continued on with these missionary journeys. On the next day, we were who were Paul's companions, we departed and we came to Caesarea and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist who was one of the seven and stayed with him. Who were the seven? The seven were those original deacons, the original ones that the elders pointed uh, appointed to deal with the with the um, 
widows that were not getting their daily portion of food. They were one of the seven. They were highly regarded as, as spiritually deep, having a high godly character, having a great reputation. Now, if you remember Philip, he had gone on a missionary journey of his own. He is the one that spoke to this Ethiopian eunuch back in Acts chapter 8. That Ethiopian eunuch was riding along, reading the book of Isaiah, couldn't, couldn't figure out what was being talked about. All of a sudden, Philip was there. Philip told him about the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The Ethiopian eunuch believed. The eunuch was baptized, and then Philip disappeared and was gone. And the, the eunuch, this Ethiopian eunuch, would have gone down into Africa, into Ethiopia, and the gospel spread like wildfire in that region. Philip continued his missionary journey along the coast, ending up in Caesarea, and that's where he settled, and that's where he still lived to this day. And he had, he had seven daughters. There were, I'm sorry, he had four daughters. There were four virgin daughters who prophesied. So God used these women, these four virgin daughters, so it's not a male thing alone. It is men and women that God used to further the kingdom. So Philip was an evangelist. He preached the good news. He told people of, of the good news of Jesus, of all that he did, all that he was and accomplished for us. And he had four daughters who were highly regarded, who even in history, if you look at ancient records, these daughters, or at least some of these four daughters, were highly esteemed as people who were followers of Christ, who spoke about Christ. It's just interesting note. But they went there, they stayed with him, and they would stay there many days. It says, and as we stayed many days with Philip, and hearing from Philip, and talking to Philip, and visiting with Philip, and fellowshipping with him, and hearing from the daughters, uh, and just enjoying life together, and sharing about what happened in all these churches, there was a certain prophet named Agabus. And this Agabus came down from Judea, even though Judea would have been to the south, he came down because Judea would have been really Jerusalem. He came down from Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. He came down from Jerusalem, even though it was to the north. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own hands, Agabus' own hands and feet, and he said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man, uh, bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. So this Agabus came down to Paul, to the north, he came down out of Jerusalem, came to Paul, he bound himself up, and he said, This is what's going to be done to you when you get to Jerusalem. Now, when we, that's all of the traveling companions of Paul, Luke, who had been writing this, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You know what's going to happen. You've been warned multiple times, don't go there. Why are you pushing it? Why are you going to go there? Well, here's Paul's response. Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am not, I am ready. I'm ready. My life doesn't matter to me. I don't consider my life as anything other than surrendered to Jesus. I am ready, not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased saying, the will of the Lord be done. Paul, if that's your decision, if that's what you want to do, we just pray that God's will would be done in your life. We pray that the Lord's will would be done because you're not going to listen to us. You're not going to listen to anything that anybody says. You're not even listening, it seems like, to the Holy Spirit saying these things. Paul says, look, I am in tune with God. I don't consider my life as important. Now, all of this may have been for the benefit of everybody else. Uh, the Holy Spirit may have been warning so that Everybody would warn Paul so that Paul would have the opportunity to say, I don't live for myself alone. I live for Christ. So Paul, uh, God may have been using Paul to do something even greater for the benefit of the disciples so the disciples would realize that nothing matters in life as much as serving the Lord. Your life doesn't even matter as much as serving the Lord. So they finally said, look, your will be done. Your plan, God, not ours. Now, after those days, we packed up and we went up to Jerusalem. 
Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea decided to go with us, and they went with us. And they brought a certain man named uh, <clears throat> Maniason of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. So he had a home there in Jerusalem. We're going to stay with him. We'll take him with us from Caesarea, where we are at, from the area that we are at. So all of these, and now if you remember from the beginning of this uh, this whole timeline of the last couple of chapters, Paul was trying to make it back to Jerusalem for the high holy day of Pentecost. He did not want to miss it. He felt like he needed to be there. You were expected, if you were a Jewish male, to be at Pentecost. It was an, uh, an expectation that was had upon you, and Paul wanted to be there. Nothing was going to stop him. And so he went, along with all of the companions and all of, or some of the other disciples, they all went there and they were going to stay with a certain man uh, who must have had a place there in some manner. So Paul's going to come to Jerusalem. So it says, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. That is, all of the church leaders, James, who was the leader of the church, that would have been the brother of Jesus, and all of the others, they greeted us, they were glad to see us. Now, on the following day, Paul went in with us to James, they were going to have a meeting together, and all the elders were present. Now, when Paul had greeted them, he told in detail those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they were excited. They glorified the Lord. It's so exciting to hear of all of these, this recounting of the story of the success of God in all of these regions. Do you know, that's one of the things that keeps us going to hear what God is doing, not just in our own communities, but in a global way. When you hear reports of how God is moving around the globe in certain areas, it just warms your heart. And they glorified God of the way that God was building his church among the Gentiles. And they said to him, we've had good things happening here in Jerusalem as well. You see, Brother Paul, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are zealous for the law. So the Jews that were believing, though, they had a hard time with it because they were still zealous for the law, the Old Testament, what Moses had given, and they were excited about Jesus both. So there was a real difference between the Gentile believers and these Jewish believers. So they said, Brother Paul, you see how many myriads of Jews have believed. They're zealous for the law, but they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. You, Paul, you're teaching them that the Old Testament doesn't matter, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? They, the assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. So there's a bunch of Jewish believers uh, here who are believers in Christ, but they're still doing the old law. They're still circumcising. They're still doing the things according to the law. But Paul, you're telling them not to do those things, which that's what the council had instructed him. And the council had told them to do. So their warning saying, look, when you get here, they're going to have a conversation with you because they have a difference of opinion of how we are to live and how we are to respond. There are those who take the Old Testament and combine it with the New Testament. There are those who say, no, the New Testament is fulfilling everything in the Old Testament. You don't have to keep that certain law because now you have a new way of living. You have Christ who you are living in. So here's what it says. Therefore, <clears throat> they were telling Paul, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and you keep the law. So Paul, just don't create any trouble. Just know, help them to know that you're not, you haven't put off the Old Testament, that you're still the same person you've always been, that you love the law, but you also love Christ, that you're orderly and that you conduct yourself in a worthy, holy manner. 
But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written, Paul, we, you've got our backing on this. We wrote to them and we decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Now, you remember that from a few weeks ago, probably, that that was the letter from the Jewish council, from the Jerusalem church. They, they told the Gentiles, look, you, you don't have to follow the law. We just ask you to do these things. We ask you that you should uh, keep from things sacrificed to idols, uh, from things, uh, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. That's all that we're asking you to do. We are not asking you to keep the Old Testament. You're not a Jew. We only ask that you do these certain things. You follow Jesus, do these certain things, and life is good. But Paul, you are a godly man. You are a Jew. You were a Pharisee of Pharisees. You understand all that the scriptures say. We ask that you do these things, don't create any problems, and we, you have our backing uh, when it comes to you meeting with all of these other Jewish believers. Well, that's where we're going to leave the story at today. And next time, we're going to pick it up right there in verse 26 and understand the controversy that's going to happen and why Paul is going to end up being persecuted there in the Jerusalem area. Well, today I hope that you've gotten some stuff out of this message and out of this devotional. I hope that it's been able to touch your heart, that you've been able to glean some information, that you understand that as a Gentile believer, we are not under the law. We are under grace. We are under the blood of Jesus. But the Old Testament gives us the picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus came to fulfill. We should have a natural desire to want to honor God in every way possible, to never be a stumbling block for somebody else, and that we can have fellowship with other believers no matter where they are around the world because we have commonality and connection because of our love for Jesus. Well, thanks for joining me today. I'll see you back here next time as we get into episode number 40 of our study of the book of Acts right there in Acts chapter 21, verse 26. See you then.